Welcome to the 2021 Big Farmland Bird Count, which is now in its eighth year. The Big Farmland Bird Count has grown year on year from when it was first launched in 2014, with the aim of highlighting the positive work being done by farmers and gamekeepers in helping to reverse the decline in farmland bird numbers. The NFU are our main sponsors again this year, and we have an increasing number of partner organisations promoting and supporting the count. All counts are entered into a prize draw, and prizes include a trail camera, 50 kilograms of supplementary bird feed, and two farmland bird feeders. Last year, over 1,500 farmers took part, counting more than 120 species across 1.4 million acres. It's an incredibly important initiative that offers a very simple way of recording the effect of conservation schemes being used by farmers and gamekeepers on their land, which could include supplementary bird feeding or growing wild bird seed mixes. Taking part in the Big Farmland Bird Count really couldn't be simpler. Firstly, you need to download and print off the online paper form and then spend 30 minutes recording the species and number of birds seen on around two hectares of your farm between the 5th and the 14th of February. You then submit your results online. This year, we've updated our online platform for inputting your data, which will hopefully be much more user friendly. It'll also mean you can review your results from previous count years. This is the form that you'll download when you want to complete your count. When completing the online survey form, the more information you can give us, the better. Any information you can give in terms of what type of supplementary feeding you use, or whether you grow game cover crops, or the total area of land your farm is, will help us present an even better picture of how well the countryside is doing in terms of looking after its fermal and birds, and that can only be a good thing. Even if you want your farm to remain anonymous, as a minimum, please can you include the county where you counted, as this allows us to analyse nationwide counts much better. When you come to actually recording the birds that you see, please don't just tick whether you've seen the birds or not. You need to include the number that you saw over the total 30 minutes. So for instance, three buzzards or eight goldfinch. A good thing to do is to tally up alongside the species name, then fill in the box at the end with your final number. If you think there's too many to count, just give an estimate. So you might think, why do I need to bother doing this? Firstly, it's an incredibly good way of showing the non-farming community and the press about the positive work that farmers, gamekeepers and land managers are doing as a whole across the country. It's a fantastic way of building records and assessing what your own farm is delivering. It also helps you and other farmers engage and learn about the impact of what their work is doing. And lastly, it's a fantastic PR tool that we shouldn't underestimate. Good count sites can vary, but in general, weedy stubbles, wild bird mixes, cover crops and mature hedgerows all make very good counting spots. Try to pick a relatively calm, fine day to get the best counting. This table here gives a good idea of what common crops are likely to be used by the greatest variety of birds on your farm. Kale, rape, canoe and millet are top scorers here. I'm sure we all know the importance of supplementary bird feeding for our farmland birds during this hungry period of winter through to spring. Any areas where supplementary feeding takes place is a great place to count. So on to bird identification. On the day of the count, it's likely that there'll be a bird or two or three that you don't know, but don't worry. Just make a little note of anything distinctive that you can look up in your book afterwards. Things like size, is it sparrow sized or perhaps blackbird, crow or goose sized? What sort of habitat was it in? Distinctive features like beak shape, eye stripe, maybe it has a crest. How was it flying? Was it flying slow or fast in a loopy fashion or straight? When it was on the ground, did it walk or scuttle or hop? Was it single in a pair or in a flock? And you could also have a go at describing the song or call. So such notes might be a single dull sparrow in a hedge with a pretty song. And if you were to go and look that up afterwards, you can be pretty sure that that was probably a dunnock. You'd also write, you saw a thrush sized 
grey and brown bird stripping a hawthorn bush in a group of five to ten and when it was on the ground it hops and you would then look that up and be pretty sure that was a field fair. So now on to some of the birds you may see and this will be a small selection of indicator farmer birds and how to tell them apart from others. So first up is the sparrows and the key thing to look for here is location. So the sparrows on the left you are more likely to see around buildings, farm buildings and houses. That is the house sparrow and the one at the top is the male who has a very strong coloration around his head and on his chest. You can see this pie chart arrangement of grey, brown, white and black with this really strong black bib and the female by comparison is quite dull. Um, she does have strong markings on her head and back but the best way to identify her is by association with the male. On the right here we have the rarer sparrow which is the tree sparrow and he's more likely to be seen um, along, along hedgerows, tree lines, edges of woodland on farmland um, and if you get a quick glimpse it's quite easy to confuse them with a house sparrow but if you get a good look you'll see this chocolate brown cap um, and a white cheek with a very distinctive black spot in it and the, the sexes are alike for that species. Another sparrow sized bird but this is notably duller overall and has a sort of uniformly grey head and all the breast is speckledy grey brown. It's a pretty common one to see on the farmland and you often see it singly on its own in hedgerows and this is a dunnock. It's not actually a true sparrow but it's what we call an accentor but one that you're very likely to see during the count. Now onto the finches. One of the commonest farmland birds is this one on the left. He has a blush pink body and blue grey head with bold black and white wings. He's a chaffinch. The female you can identify by association with the male but also she has that bold wing with the white flash too and the greeny back as well. On the other side, hard to confuse with anything else, is the goldfinch. Very common on farmland in various habitats. In winter they're usually in single or mixed species flocks and they love feasting on wild bird seed mixtures and patches of thistles or teasels and they're quite amusing to watch because they often have terrific squabbles about who gets to feed where. This finch is characterised by its olive green and grey tones with flashes of yellow which can't really be confused with anything else. So this is green finch. In winter it's usually in mixed flocks with other finches and buntings um, and these finches especially like chunkier seeds and they'll go for things like rose hips, um, blackberries and hawthorn berries so they're quite likely to be spotted in hedgerows. Another type of finch, this one is a rich brown uh, with a grey head and a blush of pink on a streaky breast. This is a linnet. The females can be confused with many other little, little brown job females so the best bet again is, is association with the male. Large flocks um, tend to form in winter and they'll be feeding on small weed seeds on the ground so quite likely to see them in stubble fields which are quite weedy. They have a very undulating and somewhat erratic flight um, and you'll often see them in a flock with goldfinches and, and other species. Hopefully you may spot our native game bird, the grey partridge, though you're more likely to see its French cousin, the red leg partridge, which is non-native and it's released for shooting in large numbers. Grey partridges are mostly grey, but they have mottled brown and white wing feathers and orange markings on their faces. Most males and sometimes the females have a large brown horseshoe marking on their breast. Red legs are a bit more exotic in their markings, particularly on their heads and wings, including distinctive white, black and red barring and also a bold black necklace around their throat. In terms of behaviour, grey partridges will be pairing off at this time of year, whereas red legs are more likely to be in groups from release pens but you might see the odd pair that are breeding descendants. In flight, if startled, 
grey partridges prefer to cower on the ground first, but if they have to move, they take off in a sort of whirring of wings and they land on the other side of a boundary like a hedgehog and they quickly regroup. Red legs tend to run if they're startled, but when they do fly, they're more chaotic and they quite often split up. Also, when par grey partridges are in flight, the rusty red rump feathers are, are more obvious and bolder than in the red legged. And also when they're on the ground, um, greys have a wonderful habit of flicking their tails when they're alert and looking around. These birds are both types of bunting and they're slightly larger than sparrows. So on the left is hopefully quite obvious. This is a yellow hammer. This one's a male, um, so very bright yellow, like a canary. They're found in a wide range of habitats. Um, so one that you could well see on your count. Um, even though they are red listed, they are fairly widespread. The female yellow hammer is yellow, but she does look a bit more greeny brown than this. On the right, we have a bunting which is traditionally associated with reed beds, so it's called the reed bunting. But they can be found quite broadly over farmland, but they particularly favour damp areas and thickets. The male has really strong head markings, even in winter. Um, usually in the summer, in the breeding plumage, it goes to this nice strong black um, marking. But in the winter, as you can see the additional photos here, um, it tends to be a bit more mottled. Uh, the female, again, a little brown job that can get confused with X number of other species, so best by association with the male. A now rare sight in the British countryside. Uh, this was once a bird that formed huge flocks on arable ground, um, preferring wide and open featureless areas without hedgerows. Um, the fat yellow bill designed for eating big grains of corn makes this a corn bunting. Note the big bright eye and also the very strongly streaky breast. In winter, um, you'll most likely see corn buntings feeding in groups and flying over weedy stubbles, and they like to settle on fence posts or prominent bushes as well. If, they, if you see them making a short flight, they often dangle their legs, which is quite distinctive. Um, if you see a flock take off from stubbles and they fly away fast, um, you may hear them making a tick, like an electric fence shorting out, and that is quite distinctive of corn bunting too. Now for a pipit, which is also a little brown job, but thankfully a bit more sleek looking and upright than the others. So it looks a bit like a miniature song thrush, except it flocks up in winter and you'll see it flying over arable fields and pastures. Um, so this is a meadow pipit. Note the very slim beak, which makes it very different from the other small birds, um, which eat seeds and have a slightly thicker bill, but this one specialises in invertebrates, so it has a, a dinky, slinky beak. Now for a lark, and this one is most often spotted in the sky, flying high and singing its twittering song over open farmland, so this is a skylark. It's not terribly distinctive plumage to look at, but if you see it on the ground, you can gauge its size, um, and it's slightly smaller than a blackbird, and you may spot that distinctive crest on its head. It is quite often confused with the meadow pipit, but skylarks are bigger and their flight is totally distinctive. It's hovery and it's fluttery, whereas a pipit is quite direct, interspersed with the odd flap. So we'll feature one wader today that you may be lucky enough to spot on farmland, and that's the lapwing. It's most likely to be seen on open farmland and wetlands with short vegetation and in winter they flock on pastures and ploughed fields and I quite often see them in big mixed flocks with golden plover. If you see them foraging on the ground you'll see their distinctive black and white plumage and maybe get a glimpse of that lovely iridescence that looks a bit like oil and water. They've got a quiff too and a probing beak and they move along in a sort of scuttling walk. In flight, you can see their strongly curved wings and their stark black and white colouring, and they move in looping, swooping movements. Here we have two year-round resident thrushes. 
On the left, known for its fluty, repetitive, lovely cascading song, is the song thrush. About the same size as a blackbird, it has a strongly marked breast which has very dark blotches and spots turning into arrows on a pale background. On the right is a missile thrush, and this is larger than the song thrush, and the dark spots on its chest are rounder and they often melt together in places, particularly high up on the chest, to form dark patches. And it has a slightly longer tail as well. Both of these thrushes are found in a variety of farmland habitats, so they're seen on the ground most often looking for worms and beetles, but they will be found in scrub and hedges too, plucking berries from bushes. And they're very similar to blackbirds in habit as well. When they're on the ground, they hop around and then they stand up straight and cock their heads. Here we have two migratory thrushes, which are thankfully quite easy to identify if they're perched and they're eating. On the left is a red wing, uh, which could be confused with um, a song thrush, but it has this distinctive yellow eye stripe and also that red flash under its wing that gives it its name. Um, the breast also has longer, thinner streaks on it than our song thrushes or missile thrushes do. On the right is a field fair, and this is a much more boldly marked thrush. It has a grey head and a yellowy throat and a lovely snowy white breast with these um, really bold arrow and U-shaped markings. And both of these thrushes are lovers of berries, like our year-round thrushes, the song thrush and the missile thrush. Um, and these often flock up together in winter and um, they can descend on a bush and strip it of its berries in minutes. And they can be seen also on ploughed ground with other soil probers like golden clover and lapwing. So to finish with a refresher of the corvids, which are sometimes confused, um, on the left we have a uniformly black corvid, often seen alone or in loose gangs with other crows or corvids. That's the carrion crow, and they have a, a cawing call. The one in the middle has a longer, lighter grey beak, which provides a stark contrast to its domed black head. And that's the rook, often seen in big groups foraging on the ground or croaking in, in the rookeries in the trees. And the one on the end with the beady pale eye is the jackdaw, which is slightly smaller than the others. And it's grey in colour with a black face. Uh, which contrasts really well with its grey hood. It often flocks up with rooks, so you'll often see these two species together um, and huge crowds flying overhead. And amongst all the croaking and the grating noises of the rooks, you'll hear the jackdaws and they're the ones that are cackling like the hyenas. So that's the end of the webinar. Hopefully you can take away one or two tips to help you with this year's count. And just remember that most of the people doing this count are not experts, so don't be afraid to have a go and look up anything you're not sure about afterwards. Most importantly, though, thank you for helping collect data on farmland birds and we hope you enjoy it.